us pray. Father, you are the word, and you came and lived among us to give us an example of what it means to live an obedient and trusting life. Your son Jesus showed us the importance of scripture and how you intend it to work in our lives, to guide us, to direct us, to correct us, and to give us a hope for today and for the future. Be with us now, we pray, as we go into your word, we read what you have to say, and help us to listen with our hearts that we may take home a message of hope and security. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Today's scripture is from Psalm 127, and we use this psalm as we continue the summer series, the Summer of Psalms. Hear the word of the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And now let us meditate silently on the words of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Spirit never ceases to amaze me. Jenny and I have not consulted with each other about today. The only thing we knew was that it took two women to take Rob's place. Um, but um, in her opening prayer, without even knowing it, Jenny mentioned the two themes of today's sermon, the house and children. I knew a Scottish theologian once and listened to him speak for several days at a conference. And at the very end of the conference, his blessing to all of those gathered was, may the Holy Spirit work a little mischief in you. And sure enough, the Holy Spirit continues to work a little mischief even in Jenny and me this morning. And I hope he does the same for you. I can count on one hand the school teachers who had a deep impact on my life. One of them was, Le was Lena Kaiser, a razor-thin stick figure of a woman with hair that was never tamed and a sense of humor that made learning fun. I literally almost danced into her class. Leaping Lena, as we called her, taught me Latin, and I absolutely loved her class. Though she has long gone to her heavenly reward, I love her still because all those Latin words continue to help me decipher a word's meaning when I don't know it, especially when I'm watching the spelling bee, the national spelling bee each year. As a nod to her, I chose to use a Latin title for today's sermon. If you've looked it up, then you know its meaning. If not, you'll have to wait till the end. At least that way, I'll have your attention from start to finish, because there may be a clue in the middle. Psalm 127 appears pretty much in the middle of a collection of psalms known as the Songs of Ascents or the Pilgrim Songs. 
Psalms 120 through 134 offer encouragement to those who seek to worship God, much as we do when we gather here each Sunday, or as we worship alone in prayer, study, and meditation. Why is it called the Song of Ascents? The city of Jerusalem is situated upon a high hill, and as Israelites traveled to Jerusalem for at least three main yearly festivals, they had to climb or ascend the hill to the city. Travelers or pilgrims sang this collection of psalms as they approached Jerusalem, expressing their hope and confidence in God. For example, Psalm 120 speaks of God's presence during distress. Psalm 122 is a prayer for the city of Jerusalem. Psalm 124 tells us that our hope comes from God alone. And Psalm 126 reminds us that the Lord has done great things. According to some sources, the priests also sang these songs as they walked up the steps to the temple. One thing is certain, these psalms or songs were used to prepare for worship. Now I wonder, if we were to sing songs to prepare our hearts for worship as we approach the church, what would some of them be? Perhaps Amazing Grace or 4,000 Tongues to Sing, Blessed Assurance, Great is thy faithfulness. Maybe I didn't get it in my younger years, but I remember my dad opening the console stereo, slipping a 33 and a third record out of its sleeve, setting it on the turntable, and placing the stylus in just the right place so we could hear Tennessee Ernie Ford sing spirituals as we readied for church. As I remembered this tradition while preparing this sermon, I think now it was a way for us to prepare our hearts for church. Those were our songs of ascent. Now, if you don't know what a stereo console is, a 33 and a third record, a turntable or a stylus is, or you've never heard of Tennessee Ernie Ford? <laughs> then you're not as old as some of us in this crowd today. So Google console stereo and select videos to see how some of us used to listen to music. Then Google Tennessee Ernie Ford and listen as his mellow baritone voice serenades you with spiritual country and pop music. Amen, older people. Amen. Amen. Oop, I'll take the top off to drink the water. Most scholars believe that Solomon wrote Psalm 127, but others suggest that David wrote it for Solomon. Regardless, its theme and content have something to say to us today. It begins... Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It establishes the theme of the necessity of God's blessing in everything we do. But what is this house of which the psalm speaks? Is it a literal house? The temple that Solomon built? A family unit? A community? Scholars suggest it could be any one of these. For our purposes today, I'm going to lean towards its meaning as the temple, what for us today would be the church, and specifically this church, Cherokee Presbyterian Church. I think we all need to take time to occasionally evaluate what it means to be in church, what it means to go to church, what it means to belong to a church what it means to be a church family or to have a church home. As we explore our deep need for God's blessing, it's appropriate to examine 
our personal motivations for worship and to confess our sin as God reveals it. Jesus had harsh words for people who did not seek God's blessing in worship. The Pharisees, rather than seeking God's blessing, behaved in a way to promote themselves. Is it possible, friends, that you and I can be cut from the same cloth? From Matthew 23, we read these words. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut out the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First, clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. In other words, let's think about the time we spend getting ready, getting dressed for church, choosing our outfit, shaving our face, fixing our hair, putting on our makeup, choosing the matching shoes, dress or pants, all those decisions we make compared to the time that we spend preparing our hearts, examining our attitudes, looking at our activities and seeing if there's any sin in them. Think about the time we spend on each of those. Author Paul Tripp writes, the public religious acts of the Pharisees were not the result of deep devotion in their hearts toward God and the work of his kingdom that caused them to live the way they did. No, they did these things in the absence of that devotion. That means they did not do them for God and his kingdom at all. They did them in the allegiance to the kingdom of self for the purpose of personal power and public acclaim. True Christianity is always a matter of the submission of the heart to God, something that only rescuing grace, God's blessing, can produce. And so, we examine, God reveals, we confess, God gives grace, and we live under his blessing. I wonder how many times we remember that we would not be here today without God's blessing. This house, this church, your church home would not exist unless God had worked in the hearts of those who saw a need, responded to God's call, sought out guidance and direction, and slowly but surely watched Cherokee Presbyterian grow from a small gathering in a borrowed facility to an established church family with an established place to gather, worship, and serve. It is only by God's blessing that this church exists. But there were hands, feet, and minds that put God's blessing into action. And only by God's blessing were those actions accomplished. And only by God's blessing has this church continued to grow and thrive in service, in knowledge, and in wisdom. Psalm 127 reinforces this. Without God's blessing, building a house, whether it's a home, a family, a church, or community, 
is simply a fruitless activity. Now, most of us do not ascend to this particular house. The land is just a bit flat. But as we approach it, it's a good thing to remember that the very foundation of this house is God's blessing. This is not to deny that building whatever the structure or organization does not require human effort. It does. Just ask the teenagers and adults who participated in work camp this year. Ask the many volunteers who coordinated the entire experience requiring mental preparation and planning. In a sense, they all built a house. But with God's blessing, their work has an eternal value that is immeasurable. God's blessing must be the first and only priority of all that we seek to do. The psalm goes on to warn us that any labors completed without God's blessing will be fruitless and will cause us to experience anxiety and worry. Without God, our efforts will be frustrated because we have our priority in the wrong place. The psalm then turns to the subject of children. And certainly in this house of God, in this church family, we have children who come to us from different families. But I believe they all belong to each of us. We are all their parents and grandparents and maybe great-grandparents. And I believe it's our corporate responsibility to model for them what it means to seek God's blessing first. It matters what each of us teaches them. It matters how we show them what love and mercy look like. It matters how we exhibit obedience and spiritual discipline. It matters how we help them learn to trust God and to have faith. The most important thing we can leave to them is the knowledge of how to become a child of God. Solomon uses an interesting metaphor when he speaks about the children. He compares them to arrows in the hand of a warrior. Okay, warriors, let's think about this for a moment. Like any sport, I'm reasonably certain you can't use just any old arrow and expect to be successful. Arrows must be carefully shaped and formed. They have to be guided with skill and strength. They have to be maintained or they will not fly straight. They have to be aimed and given direction. They will not find direction on their own. The arrow is an extension of all the warrior's strength and accomplishment. And as with any weapon, the arrow has the potential for much good and for much evil. And so it is with our children, the children of this church. They too must be shaped and formed, guided with skill, maintained, aimed, and given direction. They are an extension of who we are as adult believers. For they are watching us, and they are listening to us. And like the arrow, they have much potential for good and for evil. A sobering thought. An archer needs certain skills to shoot an arrow effectively. Let's think about these skills in terms of what we need to influence the children of our church. Accuracy. Know the word of God. Don't misquote it. Know it. Balance and coordination. Are you balanced in your thought processes? Are you coordinating in the way you apply grace and mercy to others? Or do you withhold it from some and give it gladly to others? Composure. Do our children see us lose our tempers? stomp our feet and throw tantrums when the world doesn't act like we want it to? 
drawing and loading the arrow. Let's think about the birth process as the drawing and the rest of their life as the loading. You hold the bow. I don't even know how to do this. You hold the bow, you pick up the arrow, and you put it in the string, and you fling back, and you've got, you've got to load it correctly. You've got to knock the arrow, N-O-C-K, which means putting the arrow in the right place on the bowstring. And finally, precision. We have to know where we are training these children to go. We have to understand that it is up to us to point them to the eternal promises of God. That yes, they will make mistakes in their growing, but that God is always forgiving and compassionate. And that is what we must model for them as well. We must be good warriors. If we can think of the warrior skills in terms of our individual spiritual devotion, God can develop in us the ability to nurture the children in our church. As we seek God's blessing as warriors, our roles as spiritual parents have a much greater opportunity to impact the lives of our children. An ancient African proverb says, it takes a village to raise a child. Amen? Amen. To which I would add, it takes a village of adults seeking God's blessing to raise a child for eternal purpose. Amen? Amen. We're all responsible to and for our church children. Let's make sure we seek God's blessing as their village. They are watching us. The great theologian Charles Spurgeon said, Of every church and every system of religious thought, this is equally true. Unless the Lord is in it and is honored by it, the whole structure must sooner or later fall in hopeless ruin. Much can be done by man. He can both labor and and watch but without the Lord he has accomplished nothing this is why seeking God's blessing today and every day is so vital to our lives as believers we do not want our efforts to fall into ruin we do not want to accomplish nothing as believers we want everything we do to be done as to the Lord Nisi Dominus Frusta. Without God, frustration. God's blessing is our one great necessity and privilege. May God add his blessing to these words. Let us pray. Our great and heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, for the blessing of your presence, for the guidance of your spirit, for the love and the compassion of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this church home and for those whose hands and hearts followed your will and brought it into creation so that others might find a home here as well. Father, we thank you for your glory as expressed in your creation. As hot as the sun is these days, we thank you and praise you for its warmth. We thank you for the warmth of your spirit within us as it encourages us to grow and to seek you out in all that we say and do. We thank you, Lord, for our church family, for our friends who sit beside us, behind us, in front of us, for those who are not here today but are watching online, 
And we seek your blessing upon this house and upon all that we do as a church family. This morning we specifically pray for Mary, for Barbara, for those who are grieving, for those who are rejoicing, those who are struggling, those who are seeking, those who are praying for direction, those who are serving, those who are waiting. In their own needs, Lord, meet them there and provide what they need to journey through whatever time they are experiencing in their lives. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.